the history of head wraps and black culture. Head wraps are a vital part of many cultures, especially in parts of the African continent. Historically, however, in the U.S., head wraps were imposed on black women as a badge of enslavement by their white masters. In this way, the head covering was used to distinguish between black people without power from those who held it. This history, however, never diminished the ancient cultural and spiritual significance of head wraps consistently held in sub-Saharan Africa and black communities over the generations. The head wrap endured, acquiring significance as a form of self and communal identity and as a badge of resistance, proudly and publicly worn. But it is essential to know that tying a piece of cloth around the head is not specific to any one cultural group. Men and women have worn and continue to wear some type of fabric head covering in many societies. What does appear to be culturally specific, however, is the way the fabric is worn. In other words, the style in which the fabric is worn is the ultimate cultural marker. In order to explore this concept, careful note must be taken of the significant difference between the style of cloth head coverings as worn by Eurocentric cultures versus the head wrap as styled by black women. For instance, the head wraps, which are known to be called many names in the various African countries, do mean many things when worn. When styled, one could tell if a woman was married, widowed, mourning, her wealth, her ethnicity, age, and a couple of other things. Before anything else, let's review what they signify in this modern era. Head wraps and what they stand for in this modern era. Head wraps indeed have some roots from the African continent linked to it. However, they have taken on an entirely different meaning in this modern time. Some black women wear head wraps before going to sleep to prevent their hair from breakage and getting relatively dry due to cotton pillowcases. Head wraps have been more or less a remedy for most black women who have busy schedules full of activities or tasks that would otherwise prevent them time to style their hair quickly. Many African women wear head wraps to attend weddings, funerals, baby showers, and many other cultural festivities to this very day. Spiritually and historically, African women and black women have donned head coverings as a religious aesthetic. From hijabs in the Islamic tradition to white lace coverings or habits in the Catholic and Ethiopian Orthodox Church, these women have known that covering one's head is not only an act of faith, but is also perceived as a sign of respect, humility, and modesty. And according to scripture, Christian women cover their heads when praying or prophesying. Religious History of Head Covering With looking at our past cultures, it's seldom recognized how much the head covering was a major part of the apparel of women even Christian women. The Bible's first mention of veiled women are subtle, yet clear enough to see that a head covering was normal for at least the married women. Face veils are mentioned in the scriptures about Rebekah and Tamar. In Numbers chapter 5, verses 11 to 31, referred to as the law of jealousy, an accused woman's hair is to be unbound. In the book of Isaiah, an unmarried woman's hair is uncovered to her shame. Women have covered their heads in ancient times for modesty, as religious Jews still do today. Islam adopted the modest dress of the early Jews and Christian women in the Middle East. The result being that ancient clothing styles and the veiling practice have persisted in the Middle East, almost unchanged for thousands of years. In India, married women wore a veil on their head and can often be seen doing so still. Even ancient Assyria had laws on women's head covering, making it obvious that the practice is very ancient and widespread. Greek and Roman art and literature indicate that head coverings were worn, but not necessarily enforced. There was certainly a bridal veil ritual and enough other mentions to believe that married women were expected to go about veiled on the street for both modesty and to show marital status. 
the Apostle Paul wrote an authoritative message on head coverings for the followers of Christ when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He gives more reasons than the traditional modesty of it and explains the symbolism of the authority structure demonstrated by head covering. As Christianity spread throughout Europe, the world church leaders were unanimous in asserting that, at least during religious gatherings, the married women must keep their heads veiled. During the earliest days, both married and unmarried women were thoroughly covered. Often even small girls were veiled. As fashions change and morals loosened, women wore smaller and smaller head coverings. Eventually, the veil was discarded and the only cap was retained. Letting hair show at all used to be considered shockingly immodest for adult ladies. But in time, people grew accustomed to seeing the new styles. Wealthy women of fashion and girls that were trying to attract a husband often went with their hair exposed, especially to social events. To have your hair showing gave the impression of youth, since it used to be that you would only see young girls with an uncovered head. Among the lower classes and very pious women to whom fashion had less importance, full-time wearing of the head covering persisted. As the centuries rolled by, women were wearing their head coverings less and less often, going from full-time veiling to subtle caps to putting on their bonnets only when going out in public and to church. In the Victorian era, women were forgetting the religious aspect of the head covering and saw it as merely a proper thing to do. The Catholic Church's Code of Canon Law required women to cover their heads in church as late as 1917. In other denominations also, women wore their hats when in church and in public places. In the 1960s, during the Social Revolution, when cultural and religious norms were being challenged, women stopped wearing their hats in church altogether. The second wave of feminism had promoted new attitudes towards women's roles and apparel. The head covering has persisted among conservative denominations. Some still teach women to wear head coverings full time and not just when in church. Across America and Europe, individuals in non-conservative churches and some who worship at home are readopting the head covering. Something that was once gone out of fashion and religious practice is now regaining recognition by Bible believers today. The Dress Code, Slavery to Segregation. Initially, the head wrap wasn't intended to be an expression of black resistance or beauty. During the slave era throughout the American South, South America and the Caribbean, there was a growing concern regarding slave masters the wives argued that the slave masters, their husbands, were becoming distracted by the different skin tones, hair textures, and the exotic looks of slaves. Thus, many slave masters required enslaved black women to wear head coverings. As a result of this worry, European colonies created laws as a way for them to easily identify slaves. In 1735, South Carolina passed the Negro Act, which was a law that listed the types of clothing black people were allowed to wear. Appearing on that list of items was a section which said, enslaved black women must wear their hair bound in handkerchief as a part of their uniform. Here, we have the start of the humble head wrap. The uniform head covering served functional purposes, like protecting women's scalp from the sun, sweat, grime, and lice when they worked out in the fields. They were also symbolic markers, indicating a slave's inferiority in the social hierarchy of the time period. But enslaved black women found many creative ways to turn lemons of oppression into lemonade of freedom and expression. For example, in parts of Central America like Suriname, black women used the folds in their head wraps to communicate coded messages to one another that their masters could not understand. It didn't stop there. In 1785, the Spanish colonial governor, Esteban Rodriguez Miro of Louisiana, passed the Tion Law and demanded that Afro-Creole women wear Tions, which is a turban-like head wrap. 
Tian laws aim to reaffirm the social order by marking women of color as different, all in an attempt to undermine their exotic looks. This just resulted in another failure because the Afro-Creole women protested by decorating their Tians with amazing colors, jewels, ribbons, and feathers. Ultimately, these beautiful head wrap displays evoked a sense of freedom and became a bold fashion statement. What started off as oppression, Black women used creatively to empower. After the United States abolished slavery in 1865, some Black American women continued to wear head wraps creatively. However, the style ultimately became associated with servitude and homeliness. The mass production of mammy images like Aunt Jemima wearing a checkered hair tie reinforced such stigmas. To assimilate, newly freed Black men, women, and children sought to adjust to a new way of life within post-slavery America. In doing so, many Black women abandoned wearing head wraps, moving further away from society's assigned status of enslavement to a status of freedom. Black women began embracing Eurocentric standards for beauty and professionalism and adopted straightened, pressed, and curled hairstyles as a way to reduce their time navigating through society. As a result, Wearing head wraps in public completely fell out of favor in the 20th century Black communities. However, women continued to wrap their hair in silk or satin scarves at home to preserve hairstyles throughout the week. Fast forward to the 1960s and 70s, men and women began to unapologetically reclaim their heritage as a means of rebellion and pride. Head wraps became a central accessory of the Black Power and Black is Beautiful movements. The head wrap, like the Afro, was now an embrace style once used to shame and enslave people. National Head Wrap Day, Glory Recovered. In the 1990s and 2000s, artists like Erica Badu, Lauren Hill, and India Ari popularized colorful and towering wraps for a new generation. Just as the neo-soul genre repackaged Black music styles like jazz, hip-hop, and R&B, these artists' head coverings paid tribute to a long, rich history of Black hair culture. While the style was new and unfamiliar to many outside the African diaspora, head wraps quickly entered the mainstream. Today, the head wrap is in vogue yet again. With the natural hair movement still booming, many women are turning to them as a fashionable protective style option. Over the last five years, head wraps have become a central feature of fashion within the black culture. In 2019, the state of California ruled that it was illegal to discriminate in workplaces and schools on the basis of natural hair with the Crown Act. Reclaiming pride and traditions and claiming the undeniable beauty of Blackness requires constant effort. Head wraps have been allies in the workplace for Black women, keeping them protected from harm, acting as advance warning of danger to communicate with our people, and as a shameless crown worn with reverence. It is a reminder that which is already within, strength, royalty, and the legacy of an unbreakable God-belonging people. It is the head wrap that serves as a unique historical attribute among Black women. So much so, November the 20th has gained recognition as National Head Wrap Day, a day we celebrate, commemorate, and educate for the culture. So, no matter where you travel throughout the United States, South America, the Caribbean, or the African continent, the head covering, scarf, or head wrap, whatever you choose to call it, has stood the test of time and remains an important part of Black culture pre-colonial, colonial, and present day. Using head wraps as protection is still a very valid act of self-care and reverent faith. As Maya Angelou said, your crown has been bought and paid for. Put it on your head and wear it. <laughs>